please the court. My name is David Levin, and my co-counsel is Jason Lessinger. We're with the Icard Merrill Law Firm. We're representing the Appellant uh, 5F. And um, with your permission, I would like to address the uh, riparian rights issues, and Mr. Lessinger would address the collateral estoppel issues. Okay. And we'd like to reserve 10 minutes for rebuttal, please. Okay. You may be familiar with the um, popular TV show called Mythbusters. It's a show that they, well, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, pre the premise of the show is that um, they take an urban legend, something that has been repeated so many times through um, <coughs> media, word of mouth, that a statement such as if you put a cat in a microwave, it explodes, uh, and determine whether or not there's any, um, any basis to that urgent urban legend. Well, about 100 years ago, the Florida Supreme Court was uh, asked to be mythbusters with respect to an urban legend of the day that there was a common law riparian right to wharf out, as well as um, a, a urban legend that that, that uh, common law riparian right to wharf out um, was also part of the recognized common law uh, riparian right of um, access or ingress to and from riparian waters. So in and the Thiessen case, the Supreme Court seems to say that there is no common law right to wharf out. Your is that where if you're I'm, heading? If I might, I'd, I'd be more specific than that. There is absolutely no question that the Thiessen court determined that there was no common law right to wharf out. They were very explicit about that. And they went on to say that the, uh, the, common law, the recognized common law right of access did not include a right to wharf out. And, and um, Thies, the, the, the facts in Thiessen, just, uh, just very briefly, was that Thiessen was an upland owner. He owned to the uh, uh, high water mark, which was typical at the day. Um, and there was a railroad, the, the um, uh, Gulf Florida and Alabama Railway, that purchased submerged lands uh, off from uh, Mr. Thiessen's property. And they filled it in to uh, make a railroad track, and, and Thiessen um, sued the, the railroad, claiming that um, his riparian rights under a particular statute, the, what's, what's known as the, uh, the Riparian Rights Act of 1856, had been violated. Well, the court, Thiessen said, excuse me, the Florida Supreme Court in Thiessen, in, in the first time that they heard the, uh, the, the case, said that, well, wait a minute. Um, this statute only gives r the right to wharf out to those upland owners who own to the mean low, to, to the low water mark. In common law, the space between the high water mark and the low water mark was held by the king for the use of the public in general, for, for bathing, fishing, etc., and that you couldn't obstruct those rights with um, any type of structure without a special privilege being granted by the king. So that's why um, when, when the United States began to be developed, uh, the king's ownership of that space between the high mark and the low mark where you couldn't put any structures, became an obstruction to the, not America's ability to uh, develop commercially. Because back at that time, you know, uh, commerce by boat was really basically the, the only way that, um, um, that commerce took place, that the waterways were today's equivalent of modern highways. And so early on, even back as early as 1641, the colonies established by legislation, a right of a riparian owner to wharf out beyond the low water mark, beyond that which the sovereign controlled, in order to have access to the um, uplands um, uh, so that they could support the boats and commerce um, of the day. And so the Florida legislature, following a long line of legislatures uh, of the colonies um, um, beforehand, um, established a right of a riparian owner to create a dock, a wharf, beyond the low water mark out into the navigable waters. In fact, in, as far as the channel of the navigable waters, assuming that they didn't otherwise affect um, the ability for um, other boats to navigate. 
And so what Thiessen, the court in Thiessen said is, well, wait a minute, Mr. Thiessen, um, you don't own to the low water mark, and therefore you do not qualify for the ability to construct a dock or a wharf under that statute. Well, Thiessen asked for a rehearing after that decision, and Thiessen said, well, yeah, you know, I might have asked for um, relief under that statute, but I also have a common law right to wharf out and a common law right to, for access. And both of those have been blocked by virtue of what the railroad did. So it became necessary for, for the Florida Supreme Court in Thiessen to actually investigate whether or not there was such a common law right to wharf out in the absence of the statute, the Riparian Rights Act, of, um, of 1856. And the Supreme Court made note of the fact that um, Thiessen's attorney was saying to the court that, that the courts are, the, the, the law books are filled with, with, with citations and references uh, about how there was a common law right to wharf out. But the uh, Florida Supreme Court bemoaned the fact that not a single case was presented um, to substantiate that allegation that there was this common law right to wharf out and did their own thorough investigation and determined that there was no such right. And so they ruled in favor of Thiessen, recognizing that there was a common law right of access to and from the water, but that the other part of his claim that he, he was denied the right to have a, a, a dock or a wharf which, remember, back at that day was a very economic, uh, com a commercial, excuse me, a commercially uh, viable facility that he would have been deprived profit for, for not being able to have that dock. The court said, no, you're not going to be damaged for not being able to have a dock because you have no common law right to a dock and okay, you didn't. Can, can you coordinate that case with the ferry pass case that the case refers to that the Supreme Court decided a few years earlier which has language in it that seems to say well yes there is a right the it's very important to distinguish between a right and a privilege and the ferry pass case said that they and they listed the riparian rights and they talked about the right to access the right to use of the water and what have you and then they said there's certain privileges that are also available to a riparian owner. That privilege in that case was a qualified privilege to wharf out. The qualified privilege to wharf out um, is again, goes back to the common law, which talks about that space between the, up, between the high mark and the low mark that the, king, that the king controlled. And that the king could grant a privilege, today we, I guess we would call it a permit, to be able to put a dock on the king's land. Mm -hmm. And so there were recognized privileges back at that day that, that gave an upland owner who received that privilege the opportunity to do a dock. But there's a very big distinction, and the court, the, the court in, in Ferry Pass acknowledged the distinction between a right and a privilege. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, But the in, privilege, it wasn't the privilege they were referring to was the, the privilege um, that to not interfere with the public use? I mean, that's what your opponent's going to argue. We are not in any way interfering with the public's use. And I think that's sort of a red herring that our opponents are, th are throwing. We recognize, as the owner of the submerged lands, mm -hmm. that we are subject to the public's right to navigate, to fish, to swim in our waters. Same way as the, historically, the state in its ownership of the submerged lands is also subject to those common rights because in fact, again, those go back to the common law of England where the public had such rights. It's not our intent to interfere with those rights. We recognize that our rights to the ownership of the bottoms is subject to that, mm -hmm. but that's different than whether or not the upland owner has the right to put structures on our privately owned submerged lands without our consent. Which is going back, and if I, if I might, no, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not convinced that that uh, since this is privately owned and not publicly owned, the submerged lands. I think it's a different issue a little bit from these cases because you've got the issue of their right to put something on privately owned property that 
these these public use arguments don't really come into play. Well, in, in other words, by pri by privately purchasing the submerged lands, even if there was, let's 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 take the other side because some of these cases have fragmented language. It seems to say that there's a there is a common law right to wharf out. Let's assume there is, just for the moment. Yes, sir. I'm not sure that the pri but private purchase of the submerged lands doesn't extinguish that anyway. It, it wouldn't. Or would it? It, it would not extinguish the, the private. If there was, in fact, a common law right to wharf out, right. and to get there, you'd have to, you'd so have to find something to overrule decent. But assuming, for the sake of argument, that there is, that would not give the private property owner who has a right to wharf out the opportunity to put that dock on our property without our consent. That's what I'm saying. No more than today, where most of the submerged lands are owned by the state, and people have the ability to get a permit to put a dock on the state uh, on state lands, the state, as the proprietor of the submerged lands, still has the ability to say, you need our consent before you do that. Mm -hmm. And the mere fact that you have a riparian right, given assuming that there was a riparian right, doesn't give the upland property owner the opportunity to put that dock on the state's lands without the state's consent. So we actually, stand, having purchased the property from the state of Florida, we stand in the same shoes that the state of Florida has in its proprietary capacity to determine under which terms people are going to put structures on our dock. And just like the state, our ownership of the submerged lands is nevertheless subject to such things as the federal uh, navigational servitude, the public's rights to bathe and fish and swim there, and we're not trying to take any of that away from the upland owner. Mr. Levin, if I can interrupt you just yes, a sir. second. I, 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 it would be helpful for me to have a better visual image of what I'm dealing with. And okay. I've never, I have not seen a photograph of this. I'm, I'm not sure what's in the record. I'm, this is a little Gasparilla Island. I'm, I'm betting, betting we're on the intercoastal side rather than, than yes, sir. The, at the Gulf side. So is this, this is a, a home with a dock that goes yeah, out what, probably through mangroves yeah, it's part, it's, No, it's, it, well, there are mangroves along the, sh uh, the fringe. Yes, there, the, indeed there are. This is part of a subdivision called Boca Grand Isles. Okay. Boca Grand Isles was developed by Sunset Realty. They bought the uplands from a previous owner, and then they bought submerged lands from the state of Florida back in the day when, when the state of Florida was selling submerged and lands. They, and they actually platted the submerged and they pla they, Well, the origi originally they platted the uplands. And I, I don't have any basis for this, but at the time that they were considering developing the uplands, when they purchased the submerged lands, the law would have given them the right to fill in those really? submerged lands. By the time they actually platted the upland, the law had changed, and they could no longer fill in those submerged lands to develop them as uplands. So, it was so, so they subsequently, so they subsequently platted the submerged lands in 19 and recorded that plat in 1989, and in fact, and, and in fact, sold um, nine lots of those submerged lots to upland owners. Ironically, one of those lots that was purchased uh, from Sunset submerged lots. Um, is is a lot adjacent to an uplands that was the subject of um, a case that you'll be hearing about the Boynton case, um, but in, in any event, what I'm saying is that is that the sunset was trying to use whatever you know they own now property. So it happens to be submerged. The sunset bought actually bought from the state. Absolutely, yes, sir. Lots. They that bought, was in the I, 50s. I, that was done. That was done. Yes, that was um, the actual date of that was. Um, um, I think it was 58. 1958. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Out of curiosity, how far out do they own? Do you know? They actually own a, a considerable amount beyond what was planned, <coughs> uh, all the way around the um, the subdivision, um, and uh, and 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 so you know they're trying to exercise their property rights the same way that the state exercises its property rights when, in addition to asking an upland owner to come before the state for permission to use the state-owned submerged lands. Depending upon the, the proposed size or use of the dock that that upland owner is seeking, the state may very well charge uh, lease fees for, and there's a substantial amount of revenue that the state of Florida gets 
from riparian owners to put docks on state-owned lands. Do you happen to know when the Dressings purchased their property? No, I do not. not off, not Sometime the after the, the submerged lots were acquired oh, yes. privately? Oh, yes. Must yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well after, I assume. I, I believe so, yes. Um, and when, so... <clears throat> when they went through this permitting process, did, did the, the owner prior to 5F, were they on notice at all of the permitting process for the dock? Apparently they got permits from Lee County and I don't know about Corps of Engineers on this. The, the, oh, I'm sorry, the, the owner of the uplands, the dressings. The dressings. The dressings. Yes, permits. We, yes. And, and the question you are, I'm sorry? Well, I'm, uh, 5F wasn't the owner at that time. As no, I three, understand. Uh, predecessor 3F was, was the owner 3F. at that time. <laughs> yeah. And, or 7F. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, yes, I mean, they were, they were certainly familiar of what the, what the requirements were in terms of, of, uh, of uh, permits and, and what have you. You know, look, that's that's a Mr. asset. I think, I I think what Judge I'm just sorry. trying to figure out whether there's any estoppel or, 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 or waiver or the like from the prior owners. And went, so, I mean, you bought with notice that the dock was there. We did. Uh, but we, but I will say that before they purchased the property, they also did, did their legal due diligence to determine whether or not that dock is lawful <coughs> under the law and what rights that they would have to enforce those rights. Um, uh, should they purchase that, that property. And so, yeah, I mean, they, they looked at, uh, I looked at it for them, but the, the, the law of Thiessen, the, the statute, the only rights in Florida that relate to the right to wharf out were the two statutes, the one from, from 1856 and one from 1921, which were then subsequently repealed in 1951, and instead of, instead of having riparian rights by statute now, um, people can get permits from the state to put a dock. And that's sort of like what would the equivalent be to the riparian rights before. But again, it is subject to the discretion of the state, both in its proprietary capacity, and, there, and it also has a, another hat that it wears as a, regula as, as a regulator. So the state, one side of the state could say, yeah, you can have permission to put a dock on our property, but then they might not qualify for a permit for the dock based on the, on the regulations. And so when we need to focus, or we would like you to focus in on the, on the state's proprietary side of things, because we believe we, st we stand in the shoes of the state as it relates to what can be done as a proprietor, not as a regulator, but as a proprietor. And if you were to take the position that, yes, there is a common law right to wharf out, and yes, um, a, 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 if there is such a right, that the upland owner can put a dock on the submerged lands without the consent of the owner, not only would that affect us as the private owners of this property, but it would affect the state of Florida as the owner of a lot of submerged lands that they manage and get revenues for to give people the right, the, the right or opportunity or privilege, which is probably best, the best way to say it, of the, of the opportunity to put a dock on their property. Okay, now, the reason- We're about 18 minutes in now, and, and I'm not gonna hold anyone tightly to time other than I'll make sure that everyone gets roughly equal time and gets to say everything they need to say on this because it's complicated. I, I appreciate that. And so let me go back to my theme of, of, of now, you have become the myth busters of, of the day. Um, and that is, there. admittedly, there is a lot of dicta out there that, that would lead one to believe the urban legend that there's a common law right to wharf out. But if you look, just like the Supreme Court did in Thiessen, there has been no Supreme Court decision rendered since Thiessen which overrules or recedes from Thiessen's premise that there was no common law right to wharf out and that the right of access, which is admittedly a, right, a common law right, does not include the right um, to work <coughs> out. And what we're asking you to do, and, and would be a great service to the, to the law of the state, is to get rid of, to clarify that all this dicta that's appeared in the courts, and, and unfortunately, not only is the Supreme Court somewhat responsible for mudding those waters, but Your Honor, your court <laughs> has, to some extent, done that as well in, in some recent decisions where, where it's been stated that there is a repairing right to wharf out, a common law repairing right to wharf out, without any citation of authority. So this would give the, 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 this gives the court the opportunity 
to really clarify the law in that area. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we could go back and forth, back and forth, but it might be easier just to have one side and the other side. How's that? <laughs> I'm going to do it on the phone. If, oh. if, if, if I may approach just briefly, you said you didn't have a, a, a picture of this in your head. I know there's a plat in, in there. I there, just there haven't a plat, seen the plat. Um, this, this is the plat on three different pieces of paper. I Googled this last night and pulled up the subdivision. This is the Boynton case that was previously decided. This is the Weiner's lot. These are the Apelli's lots, which are actually on the other side of the subdivision, if that gives you a visual picture. Okay. You all seen this? Yes. All right. <coughs> And while you're on that subject, there, there, there's reference in the briefing to the fact that what was built was a, not, not a dock, but a, a fishing, pier. A fishing pier slash so, observation. Yeah, I was wondering, deck. I mean, what are we looking at? Is this, this some big towering structure? Like Judge Altenburg said, I, we, I think we all were thinking, well, it would be nice to see, you know, is this posing some unusual obstruction that a dock wouldn't? Or no, what? it does not. The only difference is, is that because of the depth of the water. We got a, we got, we got a visual aid here. So are we, are we, this is the house and that's the pier? Is that what, what we're looking at here? That T shape? The, this piece going all the way okay. up to the main. Which house actually are we? These two houses actually own it jointly. jointly. That's why there's two, oh, okay. two Napolis. Okay. okay. Yeah. But to answer your question, uh, <coughs> the, the, the reason that it's an observation deck or fishing so pier this is, is the like water. A, this is like a pier through or a walkway through the mangroves and then there's just a. A small dock that you could so that there's a walkway sit, sit and watch the sunset from that it, kind of thing. Essentially, the, the reason that that, that water's too shallow to bring bring a vessel. R right. right. They they were not able to get a sufficient permit to moor a boat there because of the potential damage to seagrasses and whatnot. So that's why they could only get a fishing pier as opposed to a a, a dock that would be sufficient for <coughs> for mooring a boat. Uh, concerning collateral estoppel. Uh, Candidly, I, I think the uh, appellees are really trying to greatly expand the law of collateral estoppel. The Florida Supreme Court has issued recent opinions on the subject, which, which clearly indicate that in order for collateral estoppel to apply, there must be mutuality of parties and mutuality of issues. Uh, in this present case, uh, the appellees are not parties to either of the earlier cases, the Boynton case or the LeClaire case. Uh, they are not in privity with any of those parties. Therefore, collateral estoppel fails on the very first critical issue that there has to be a similarity of parties. Candidly, there isn't even a similarity of issues. In the Leclerc case, what was decided was that the county had to issue a permit regardless of whether the submerged landowner consented. That was the issue in that case, not whether there was a repairing right to build a dock. In the Boynton case, there were other issues that were addressed because there was questions about accretion and whether or not the dock was actually on 5F's predecessor's land. And then there's a statement in this summary judgment in that case that says, well, they have a riparian right to build a dock, but it doesn't say whether it's because of accretions or because it's, it's a, this common law right. So there is no certainty as to commonality of issues, which would be the appellee's burden to demonstrate. The appellee's attempt to suggest that this court should employ a standard on collateral estoppel that if parties are similarly situated, that collateral estoppel would apply. But the only similarity between the appellees and the prior litigants was that they own lots in the same subdivision. Uh, the appellees would suggest that the only thing that changed was the names on the deed. Uh, the legal descriptions are different. Uh, the subject upland property is different. And the subject submerged lands are different. And as that diagram I showed you, it's not even on the same body of water. It's on a completely opposite side of the subdivision. So while the subdivision uplands are a similarity, the submerged lands that are affected are completely different. It's completely conceivable. Again, uh, my clients own private property, and they have private property rights. They can do with it as they wish, subject to the rights of the public uh, and the rights of the upland owner. The whole question is, what are the rights of the upland owner, and does it include a right to wharf out? But in this case, 
My clients have a number of different submerged lights. They could grant a license to someone to use it. They could grant an easement to someone else to use it. They could also pick and choose which pieces are important. And in it, this case, there was no easement whatsoever. No. Is, was there? No. Okay. And help me out with one thing. Yes, ma'am. Why did your client wait till the pier, the dock, was totally built prior to taking any action? Well, the police would suggest to you that that is an issue that needs to be vetted at the trial court level because of, as to whether or not there's an equitable estoppel. But, but realistically, uh, my clients came in, the dock was constructed, I believe, in the fall of 2010, and they began asking questions of Mr. Levin, hey, do we have any right to object to this? And keep in mind, there were previous opinions out there in the Boynton case that says, hey, you got a repairing right. So there was some question about what, whether or not they had those rights. Mr. Levin did a substantial investigation, reading painfully all of these very, very old Supreme Court cases, going all the way back to the Colonial Act of 1641 to say, hey, this is where the qualified right to wharf out came from. And it was never common law. It was always statutory from, from 1641. But from December of 2010, when the dock was completed, until July of 2011, is basically six months that gave Mr. Levin the time to investigate. So, no, wait, you guys do have rights here. And when did your client acquire? What was the date? Of the submerged land? The, the predecessor or when we when you, 5F you, actually 5F. took an assignment from, from yeah. 3F was shortly before uh, the dock was built. And, and uh, the police have, have raised it in the trial court that that could be an equitable estoppel or, or a waiver. I would submit to you that as a matter of law, it is not because equitable estoppel requires some sort of fraud or affirmative misrepresentation and silence is never sufficient to, to justify an equitable estoppel. And, and the bottom line is, is if... 5F's predecessors had those rights. 5F took whatever rights they had. If 3F was, was a stop to assert it or somehow had, had waived a right, then, then 5F would be as well. But they, they got whatever rights 3F had when they bought it. The question was, what were those rights? And until Mr. Levin investigated and determined that there was no common law right to wharf out, once that was done, 5F immediately saw, put them on I notice. I saw there's other lawsuits. Uh, are there other docks that have been built that your client is trying to uh, have removed or are, are the other lawsuits just prospective if you know? There are I believe five other lawsuits I think you're testing my memory here I think two of them involve existing docks that are that you're seeking to have demolished or, or, or paid removed, or, or perhaps yeah. paid for or paid for would be another good solution uh, there are several lawsuits that we initiated where people had sought permits and so Yes, we initiated those lawsuits, and all those cases have been stayed pending the outcome of this appeal. Okay. So they're, they're, they're seeking a permit from Lee County or whoever to build it? Or One of the cases, they had, they had sought a permit, and I think the permit had actually expired, and, and we had initiated suit. And, and again, we just kind of came to an agreement that said, let's see what happens in the other case to determine where we go in this one. Okay. Beyond that... Am, uh, am I correct in understanding that the trial court's Judgment, the judgment that's on appeal here was based really solely on collateral estoppel, too. Uh, it was not, Your Honor. It was based partially on collateral estoppel, and they said, separate apart from collateral estoppel, there's a common law right to so wharf out. On both, both on, on both both points. Okay. Uh, as for the collateral estoppel, going back to that for, for one brief moment, uh, as the appellees tried to expand the, 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 the similarity of parties' issues or mutuality of parties to, to, hey, as long as they're similarly situated, that's good enough, all of the case law that supports that is very tenuous to their argument, but it's always situations where there is this close legal relationship between the party asserting the collateral estoppel in second action and the party that was involved in the previous action. For example, uh, one of the cases there was a, a plaintiff sued the uh, distributor of a motorcycle uh, for strict liability and products liability and whatnot and lost and then went and sued the manufacturer. And they said, well, you can't really apply collateral estoppel because it's not the same parties. And the court said, well, it kind of is. And really, in, in my opinion, that really just gets to a, a, a type of virtual privity, whereas collateral estoppel requires same parties or their privies. Well, there's a chain of title there, manufacturer, distributor, seller. Those are the types of areas where the uh, appellate courts have expanded collateral estoppel to avoid a strict identity of parties. The other good example is the Zwig case where uh, – a criminal defendant filed a motion for ineffective assistance of counsel uh, and lost and then sued his attorney for malpractice. And the appellate court said, well, hold on a minute. We can't sanction a conviction 
and, and agree that you had effective assistance of counsel and then let you go ahead and pursue that same attorney for malpractice claiming ineffective assistance of counsel. And they said, hey, the attorney wasn't a party in a collateral estoppel sense for the, uh, uh, the first post-conviction action, but we're still not going to let you sue him civilly. So the, the, the Supreme Court did look at collateral estoppel and say, hey, we're not going to strictly enforce similarity or identity of parties under those circumstances. There's another one out there where there were shareholders of a corporation who sued an individual for fraud and won, and then that same individual turned around and sued the shareholders, let me restate that, shareholders of corporation participated in the lawsuit by their corporation. Corporations sued the individual for fraud and won. The individual then turned around and sued the shareholders of the corporation in separate actions for, for fraud, even though the corporation already proved that he frauded them. They said, no, that's close enough. The shareholders of the corporation who participated in, in the prior lawsuit are bound by it, therefore you cannot pursue them. Uh, on, on the basis of collateral stuff. We have a pretty good handle on your arguments. We're at 30 minutes right now, so we'll figure out what to do with, with rebuttal when we get to that point. Thank you. Time. May it please the court, uh, Matthew Belcastro and Buddy Hume here on behalf of the Appellees. Um, if I could start with the collateral estoppel argument. I think what's being overlooked here is that if you look at the origination of this relationship between all these parties, you have Sunset Realty owning all of these plots of property around Boca Grand Isles, and you have Sunset Realty owning all of the submerged land around Boca Grand Isles. Sunset Realty then begins selling properties to individual property owners. So property owner A comes in, buys a piece of property, builds a dock out into the water, which is owned by Sunset Realty. There is a lawsuit. Sunset Realty loses. There is a legal determination. Homeowner A has the riparian rights to build a dock onto the submerged land owned by Sunset Realty. Okay, now, what the appellants want to do is say, well, it's not Sunset Realty anymore, so forget about that. I, I, I there's no question in my mind that at least it's persuasive precedent in, in this situation. I guess what's confusing me a little bit is legally this is laid out so that there are individual lots and individual lot owners on the upland side and there are individual lots that at least theoretically could be owned by individual owners on, on the submerged side. And so a a circuit court ruling between the owner of an upland lot and a submerged lot in one spot. I'm not entirely convinced that that's collateral estoppel for owners of other similar lots. Well, I, I would submit that, in my opinion, the way the court should treat this is that all of the submerged land from, from now until the end of time should be treated like it's Sunset okay. Realties because every other owner of the submerged land is going to be in privity in that chain. So regardless of who the submerged land is, is sold to in the future, they should not acquire greater rights in that property than Sunset Realty had. If, if the Boynton case had been appealed and there was a written opinion from this court or from the Supreme Court, I'd feel much more comfortable about that because for all we know, someone just decided economically this is not worth it. So the trial judge was wrong, but I'm not going to I'm not going to go forward with this. And, oh, nonetheless. I, I, and, and, now, I, and now you want it to be binding on all future owners of all lots in the neighborhood, more or less. Well, but is this the way we want to handle things? To just say, well, they didn't appeal it, therefore they can go to, to property owner B now, and if they lose there, then go to property owner C? Well, maybe they win at C. Now we'll sue D and then lose again. So we're going to have spots along the island where some can have docks and some can't, because depending on the whim of the judge, as long as it doesn't get appealed, it doesn't make sense. You know, they had this option. They had a ruling finding a riparian right. They didn't appeal it. They didn't do anything about it. They had another ruling determining that they had no right to object. They didn't do anything about it. And now they want to sell the property so that the successor can come and challenge it. It's not fair. And that was what the USAA casualty, Bloomberg, against the Supreme Court decision said, we will consider special. Well, Wendell Holmes might say it may not be fair, but is it the law? <laughs> That's the question. No, I think what the, the, it's, you know, that was actually a legal term, the special fairness uh, there uh, is what the court said, is that, that we're going to take into consideration in that case. Uh, and I think if there was ever a time for that, 
Um, otherwise, we're going to have certain lots out there that do have riparian rights and certain ones that don't, where all of these properties derive from the same ownership, both upland and submerged lands. And just creates a, a really bad situation there. Yes. So that's our argument in terms of the collateral estoppel. Um, going to the um, riparian rights issue, this, this one is a head scratcher. Um, because there, there's no question that the Thiessen case says what it says. You have a ferry pass decision right before that, that that seems to say include different language. You have the Freed case coming after that, which interestingly enough, I want, I want to read language from the Freed case, which is, I want to say, nine years after Thiessen. Freed is 1927. Okay, nine years after Thiessen. I'm going to read from this case. Court, Supreme Court of Florida says, riparian or littoral owners to ordinary high water mark on the ocean or gulf or other navigable waters have, by common law, a qualified right with the consent or acquiescence of the state to erect wharves or piers or docks in front of the riparian holdings to facilitate access to and the use of the navigable waters. And that was in a context where the state owned the submerged land. Is Correct. That right? So if we applied that holding here, you, you have the right to build the dock, but with the consent of 5F or 5S. Well, of the state. I want to first address the issue about whether there's a riparian right. Okay. So interestingly enough, Your Honor, the Supreme Court cites Thiessen for that language. Okay. That is, they cite to Thiessen to say that there is that qualified right to build out subject to the approval of the state. All right. Well, Thiessen cited Ferry Pass with more or less the same language. Right, right. So, you know, so and I spent Your opponent's trying to distinguish a right versus a privilege. In my mind, um, whether you call it a qualified right that is subject to the, the approval of the state or a privilege that is subject to the approval of the state, it's the same thing. Um, I, I don't dispute that if there is a riparian right here, it is subject to the approval of the state under the public trust. But, your, but your argument is, is that the state has has an extra, an extra tool, an extra incentive, an extra opportunity to challenge that a private owner doesn't, that, that the private owner can't trump the riparian right, whereas the state might be able to, and that doesn't, that right doesn't pass with the uh, passing of the ownership. That's your argument. That's correct. That's correct. Um, and I think this court's decision in Brandon versus Bolt supports that kind of a finding. Um, in that case, this court was sitting in bank. Um, and the issue there was that there was an easement going out to the water. And right. one of the aspects of this court's holding was that, look, these, these folks have the right to build a dock under the common law, and they have the right to put their dock in part on the Brannon's private property. Right? Does, the, does the existence of the, of the easement in Brannon distinguish that from this case? You because see, I don't it, think it does, because there are numerous cases that talk about riparian rights being treated essentially as easement rights, right? And if if there are riparian rights when the state owns the property, they can't be extinguished just because the state sells the property to private ownership. They can't be decreased as a result of the state selling the property. So why would we decrease or diminish the riparian rights simply because the state has chosen to sell the property? Well, could it be, and I'm just, and I, I'm, I'm like you, I, I think there's a lot in these cases that is hard to reconcile, but suppose the state takes the position on some of these properties that, you know what, we don't have an interest, we don't care, and that's why we're selling it. Well, that could be. Um, Your Honor, my only explanation here is that, you know, the, the, a lot of these cases talk about the public trust doctrine, and it is the state's obligation to determine whether the construction of a dock or a pier or whatever is consistent with the competing, potentially competing obligations or rights of the public. You know, the public has the right to, to surf or swim or do whatever they want to do out there as well. So who gets to be the arbiter here? Let me ask you, Greg, because this is, and it is, it's a, it's a fascinating issue, quite frankly. I don't think um, it is, Your Honor. <laughs> 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 um, if you made a comment that some of the older cases, and I've got Freed here, I've got all the cases here, that sim suggest that if the state is involved with the state's permit, the state could provide permission to build whatever. 
Mr. Levin made the argument that they purchased this from the state. So in <coughs> essence, their argument, they stand in the shoes. They now have the same rights as the state has. So consequently, if you need to get permission from the state to build a dock, why not? The same corollary is true that you need permission from the current owner who steps in the shoes of the state to get permission to build a dock. Because the state is charged with the duty of dispensing this in a fair manner. It's the best explanation I can give you, and I think that's what's the, the basis for the public trust doctrine upon which a lot of these cases are decided. And they recognize that the reason that there are, the, the, the limitation, the qualification to this riparian right to work out is the state's right to determine whether or not it meets the competing interests of, of the public. Um, and there are a few cases that we cited that I, I will concede are factually somewhat different, but they talk about the fact that when there is a conveyance of property that does not extinguish riparian rights. And if, and riparian rights means you have the right to build out subject to the state's approval, not to the whim of a private owner who might be looking just to make a profit. And I'm, I'm not intentionally <coughs> imputing malice upon them, but that is what potentially could happen here. So I think the best arbiter in this situation is the state. And as long as the riparian holder gets the proper permits and goes through proper state approvals, that's the only restriction. There is not one case in the state of Florida or any other state that, that I've seen that says that a private owner now gets to make this determination once the private owner owns a submerged land. About the, the closest thing I saw was one of the cases your opponent cited. Maybe you're familiar with it. You can comment on it. It's B-A-R-A-S-C-H, Barash versus Odeo, 1990 second DCA case. You remember that one? I, I, I do, And that's one where we had privately owned submerged lands and there was, a, there was an easement to use a boat dock. Yeah, and and there was like a, a tie pole that went along with the dock. And the owner of the submerged land said, look, you know, they, they wanted him to remove a number of things. And the court ended up ruling that the only thing that they had to remove was that pole. And I, I didn't see any argument in there about riparian rights, but it didn't seem like the court had any struggle saying, well, they own the submerged land. That pole's, they want it out, it goes. You know, and I, was, and I thought that was about the closest thing that, and, and admittedly, it's not, quite where we are, but it, you know, what do you think about that case? Well, I, I don't think it was quite as simple as saying they want it out, it goes, because the court in that case said, well, there are certain parts of the structure that are consistent with the easement that was granted. Mm -hmm. And those parts that are consistent with the easement that, is grant, that, that, that was granted, they get to stay. The tie poles are not consistent with the easement, therefore, they've got to go. Same thing with, I think, the Tewksbury decision was another one that was based upon riparian rights, where they wanted to build a, a restaurant out on the dock. And the court said, well, that goes beyond your riparian rights. So, you know, there, there is certainly some play there in terms of how far these easement or riparian rights go. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in terms of what has been constructed on these properties, that has never been raised. There, there's never been a question that these exceed the riparian rights if the riparian rights do exist. There's been a question about whether they can, um, whether this is actually a boat dock, but, um, you know, I would submit that this court's holding in Brandon versus Bolt is decisive on that issue because this court said you could launch a small craft, you could uh, even a handheld craft, and, and that would be consistent with riparian rights. I'm almost afraid to ask this question because if I, if I wanted to go behind all of these cases that are confusing us and try to determine what the law of England was on July 4th of 1776 as to this issue, other than Blackstone, where am I supposed to look? I, apparently, Mr. Levin said. <laughs> 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 Your Honor, I, I, what I wanted to get to before was, you know, I, I, I was trying to reconcile Thiessen with those other cases, and, and the best I could do is that really the issue in Thiessen seemed to be that the, the private owner didn't own out to the low water mark. And so the court was saying, well, you know, under these circumstances, the Riparian Act of, of 1856 doesn't apply. And there's a lot of talk in that. One of the passages that, that Mr. Levin read to the court had to deal with the fact that um, the counsel in that case said, well, there's, you know, the books are full of cases that talk about your riparian rights. I think what they were trying to argue in that case is that there was a right that goes beyond the low water mark. And I think that's what the court was saying that you can't do. And I just want to read a passage here. Um, this is the court saying, we regret that counsel deemed it unnecessary to cite a single case or textbook supporting the plaintiff's declaration 
if it is to be construed to be based upon the right in the plaintiff to construct docks, piers, and other buildings from the shore beyond low water mark out to the channel. All right, and then there's another passage in the case where they cited some seemingly uh, language that was contradictory to the holding. They said, but, but that case does not recognize the right of a riparian owner to build wharves beyond the low water mark to the channel. So, it, but I can tell you as I've read Thiessen 15 times, and, and other than to say, if that, what they're trying to say here is the real issue in that case was the right to construct beyond the low water mark, then I can see a distinction between the cases, but it's not, it's not evident to me. But I can tell you that every single case that has addressed this issue, including Freed, nine years later by the Supreme Court, says there is a riparian right to these wars. And this court would certainly be reversing a lot of authority if it, if it went the other way on this issue now. And those are all the- Factually, in this case, do we know where the high and low mar water marks are? I mean, normally in mangrove swamps, this I, gets really- I, Yeah, confusing. I can tell you that, that, I, that I don't, and there are always issues, like, but I can tell you that no objection has been raised on, yeah. no issue has been raised as to that, as far as I know. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. You ought to be able to do this in about four minutes. First and foremost, uh, Your Honors, the law in this state, as announced by the Florida Supreme Court in Thiessen, is there is no common law right to wharf out. That opinion has never been receded from by the Florida Supreme Court. The Freed opinion that was decided a few years later in dicta did discuss this notion of, hey, a common law right. I think that they candidly were not as artful as they could have been in their words and should have said that it was a, a privilege with the consent or acquiescence of the state. But keep in mind, the Freed case involved two upland owners. It didn't involve submerged lands. There was no issue as to who had rights in the submerged lands in the Freed case. It was not an issue. It was two <coughs> upland owners. One upland owner said, hey, I want to build a hotel and I want to big, build a big pier. And they sent the other folks uh, a letter that said, hey, will you sign off on this? And they didn't. And then they went ahead and did a bunch of construction. And the other folks said, you can't do that. You're impeding my right of view. The free court said, hold on a minute. They asked you to sign off on it beforehand. You did nothing. You, you then waited until they were in construction. And then you sued them. And oh, by the way, they're impeding about four, five, six feet of your view. You still have access to the channel. You still have you know, a, a right of view, although it may not be perfect. You don't get there. You can't, you can't challenge that. But again, the submerged lands were not at issue in Freed, and it really was just dicta when they said that. Uh, Mr. Belcastro uh, has indicated that every homeowner in this subdivision should be treated the same and that fairness would dictate that you should uh, affirm on that basis on, on collateral estoppel. First of all, the Boytons raised other issues. They raised accretion. They raised... Uh, um, a right of access as well. There was other issues that were raised in that case, that, which is why collateral estoppel exists, because each case could be a little bit different. Other landowners, other homeowners in that subdivision have purchased the submerged lots. So when you say, hey, one, one lot owner may have a right to build a dock, one may not, the Boyntons, instead of purchasing their lot, they litigated their right, and they prevailed. And 5S predecessor did an appeal. Okay, well, they have, quote unquote, earned their right to have a dock just as if they purchased it instead of paying a lawyer. But that's what they chose to do. For that reason, collateral estoppel should not be implied in this case because there is no similarity of parties and this similarly situated standard simply doesn't get there for the exact reasons that we've already addressed. Uh, they mentioned the Blumberg case. Uh, that was a judicial estoppel case, not a collateral estoppel case, and, and, and they did draw a big distinction there, and it never changed any of the collateral rights issues. Um, I'm happy to answer any of the other questions you may have about Barash or the Tewksbury opinion, but other than that, we will rest on, rest on the what's your take? What's your take on that second DCA opinion? The Barash opinion? Yes. The only uniqueness is, is that the upland owner who was attempting to enforce his rights had an easement, so presumably, an easement holder has those same rights as the, as the upland owner. Hey, you've got a right to build this dock by virtue of your easement. You've got a right to maintain that dock. You sink a tie pole out here in the submerged lands. Well, hey, you don't have the right to do that. I, I tend to agree with your analysis of it that, hey, 
There's no question here. It's privately owned submerged land. You sunk a tie pole in it. You had no right to do so. It's 26 feet away from your easement. You can't get there from here. You got to yank that out. Just like in this case, hey, you built a dock on our land. Sorry, but you have to remove it. But more important than that, this case goes to all of 5F's other submerged lands. So to say, hey, based on this one Boynton case that addressed one tiny little piece, your rights are prejudiced as to all of your other submerged lands, fairness dictates just the opposite result than the appellees would insist. Anything else, Judge? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, before we adjourn court, um, you've, you've provided us with this photograph, which is useful. And in many cases, I would treat this in a very informal fashion, say, can I just keep it? But given the, the cases we're discussing and at least the, the, the possibility that this could go to a higher court, I would suggest to you all that you, if, it's a, if you all agree, that you supplement the record with, with a page like this. Because if I put it into our court file, it doesn't go any place north of here if, if the case goes that direction. So we, I'm not compelling you to do so, but I'd suggest that'd be a good idea. I have an answer to your question. Yes. In the, um, in the record, um, we, I submitted a uh, memorandum of <coughs> law to the trial court with an appendix that, in, that s traced the common law Traces history. Common law. And Hale is the okay. author that you would want to take okay. a look at for all that information. I hate to admit it, but I have most of these books in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. It was very well argued. Court's adjourned. Thank you all.